Now tonight we're going to talk about overcoming deception. We're going to be talking about the subject of spiritual warfare, and I'm going to try to bring some things out about spiritual warfare that we don't often realize. And one of the things that makes spiritual warfare against God's people so effective is that God's people don't often recognize spiritual warfare for what it is. And so in the middle of a spiritual attack and have no idea what's going on if we don't learn how to recognize that spiritual attack. So Ephesians 6, 11 through 13 says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against the flesh, for against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So these are levels and beings that are mentioned. Wherefore, or for this reason, which is what wherefore means, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Brother Andrew, would you please pray over this message? Thank you. Jesus, Lord, have your way in our hearts and minds to, tonight, Lord, and have our, that our ears might be receptive to you, Lord, that we might receive your word. And we have Brother Bush to preach, Lord. Thank you, Lord, and you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Now, of course, there's that word wiles. And maybe you don't know what that is, but. Um, Looney Tunes has a character <coughs> called what? E. Coyote. Say it, Sister Jackie. You've got the word for us tonight. Wiley Coyote. Alright, Wiley E. Coyote. So E is his middle name. His first name is Wile. And he's always chasing what kind of an animal? A road runner. Right. And uh, of course, growing up in North Texas and in also especially in Northwest Texas, we had road runners, which are called chaparral birds, and they don't fly. They're flightless birds like penguins, but they're really skinny and they look very, very much like the road runner on Looney Tunes. And so he was called Wile E. Coyote as a pun because he's wily. And what is wile? Wile is a plan against someone else. It's a thought always coming up with a way, usually through the Acme Dynamite Company, <laughs> to get that fast road runner. And that is what he was doing. And he never really, in all the times that Looney Tunes was running, never really got through to catch the uh, road runner. And so he was a very hungry coyote. And it didn't work. Well, the devil is the same way. He is always looking for ways to get after the saints. The Bible talks about him being a lion, seeking whom he may devour. It is his desire to devour the people of God, and specifically the warnings against the devil in Scripture are two people who are already saved. And so people who are not already saved, they may hear songs about fighting the devil. They may hear songs about praying in Jesus' name. And they may feel the power of the Holy Ghost. But the truth is, half or more of the people that are singing songs about the devil and singing songs about praying in Jesus' name on the radio or on your Spotify app, etc., have not the ability to use the name of Jesus because you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name and baptized with the Holy Ghost to be able to use the name of Jesus because the use of the name of Jesus and its power against the devil is not for people who are not saved. They have no spiritual authority. Just as important as it is to understand that, it is also very important to understand that we miss spiritual attacks when they happen. We think it's just a bad mood. We think it's a bunch of things that happen all in a row. But a lot of times we will have spiritual attacks that will come into our lives and we will not even notice it. And they may come and go without us ever having grown from them. The Bible says that the, that teaches us that the devil has no moral character. So he will violate the blood of Jesus which covers and protects us through salvation. Understanding that if the Lord allows him to, the Lord sees everything that the devil does. If the Lord allows the devil to cross that line, it is for our benefit 
if we are living righteously. If we are not living righteously and we allow the devil in, then we do not have that promise in our lives. But we know that the promise of things that happen that may be difficult, I won't use the word bad, because my pastor used to say, don't say bad, because if you're living for God, it can be hard or difficult, but it will be good in the end. But the Bible says those things will work together for good for certain people. They don't work together for good for everybody. But all things work together for good for only a very specific group of people. That is people that are in and underneath the blood of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit, the Bible says all things work together for good, the good of them that are called of the Lord. They are walking after the Spirit. And so it's very important that we understand that there are spiritual attacks and how to recognize them. The Bible tells us in Ephesians that some spiritual attacks that we are fighting in have to do with evil spirits. But the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that a great deal of spiritual attacks happen in our minds because second Corinthians chapter 10 and 5 tell us specifically that we're supposed to cast down imaginations and so the Bible tells us that we are in a spiritual warfare and we must prepare and stay trained we are supposed to think of ourselves as soldiers we are supposed to think of ourselves as runners. We are supposed to think of ourselves as people that are in a ship moving forward. We are supposed to think of ourselves as people that are always being prepared for if we're not in the middle of a warfare, we're going to be in the middle of a warfare soon. By that I mean a specific battle. The Bible tells us in Galatians 5 and 17 that your flesh is jealous of your spirit. And vice versa, your spirit is jealous of your flesh. If your flesh is in control, your spirit is over there weak in the corner, wishing it could be in control because it's supposed to be. And I talked to you about this last week, about how your flesh will be the number one persecutor of yourself. And your brain, which is your thoughts and your emotions, because we may say, I feel this in my heart, but you really don't feel it in your heart, do you? No, unless you're having a heart attack, then you're feeling it in your heart. Okay, But if you're not having a heart attack, you say, I feel my love for you in my heart. No, you're actually feeling, I feel love for you in my brain, but it's not nearly as romantic. Okay, I mean, every Spanish song that I hear when I'm eating at Don Julio says, Mi corazón, mi corazón, mi corazón. They don't say anything about my noggin in Spanish because I don't know what noggin is in Spanish. But mi corazón, which means my heart. It's where we get the, the word, the Latin word for courage, cor. And so it sounds so much better that I love you from my brain, Rachel. I feel the love for you in, in the membrane. <laughs> the, when I see you, there's a great move of dopamine in my mind. And it's released and it makes me feel good about you. It's not romantic at all. So scientists don't make good poets. So we need to understand that our brain is the function of our thoughts and our emotions. And it is our number one enemy in spiritual warfare. Okay, so the devil doesn't have to attack us with, with little imps and evil spirits that uh, run around causing problems if he can get us to adopt the thinking and the ways and the emotions of the world. And so this is important that we understand that our mind can be deceived before the devil ever enters therein uh, to do so. The Bible says we wrestle, present tense. It doesn't say we did wrestle. It doesn't say we're going to wrestle. It says we do wrestle. So the primary goal of spiritual attacks against the church or the people of the church is to weaken spiritual authority. You have spiritual authority in your life if you've been baptized in Jesus' name and baptized with the Holy Ghost. But then there are also levels of spiritual authority in the church, which is why the Bible repeatedly tells us that there is a ministry and a hierarchy of authority in the church that Jesus Christ gave to the church. And so the fivefold ministry has given spiritual authority to lead people. That's pretty much the only authority I have in this church. I can preach the word of God to you and help you. But I can't, I, my brother-in-law told me when I was in high school, he said, Alan, you can't make anybody do anything. He was talking about being a pastor. And I never forgot that. 
but I have the ability to tell you things and to tell you what the Word of God says. And I've got a tiny bit of legal authority on paper because of the church board, etc. But at the end of the day, I'm accountable to all of you. But the preacher, the ministry, the fivefold ministry has spiritual authority. That's what I'm exercising when I go to Asia. I'm exercising spiritual authority that God has given me in this country. And so, but there again, can't tell anybody what to do. So there is a spiritual authority in your life. You have unsaved loved ones. Can you force them to do anything? No. But you have spiritual authority in how to pray for them. The devil wants to take that away from you. He wants to gut your power in your life. And he will do that through deception more than anything else in the church. Let's talk about deception. 1 Peter 5, 8-9 through 9 says, Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about. He's a pretender. He's not a real lion. He's a pretending lion. He is as a, that's what a simile is, as, like and as. Walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So here's a big one that doesn't necessarily have to do with tonight, but it has to do with insecurity and jealousy. Everybody say, poor me. Okay, so this scripture says, Peter says, don't say poor me. Because he said, what, what part of this verse makes you think I shouldn't feel sorry for myself? What part of it? Somebody say it. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren. That's a passage there where it says, don't think you're alone. Everybody say, it's not just me. So everybody is going through stuff and they're always going through stuff. That's a, that's a form of deception that comes from our own minds. Self-pity is destructive, a destructive force against the people of God. And so the Bible says we need to stay alert and be vigilant against the work of the devil. Always understanding where, where this scripture does not mean, I'm trying to find the devil behind every rock. That's not what it means. And there are many people that are afraid to talk about spiritual warfare because they think it's going to make people in the church going around looking for the devil behind every rock. Understand that the biggest devil is in your head right here. And it is the enemy of our spirits. Your own thoughts and emotions are the the enemy, a very jealous and envious and covetous enemy of your spirit. And when you get full of the Holy Ghost, it clouds out the thinking and the emotions that cause problems and only leaves room for more healthy thoughts and emotions. So, uh, and which one's going to win? The one you feed the most. When we mention the phrase spiritual warfare, we're often referring to the manifestations of the enemy that take on the form of thoughts in our minds, but sometimes those thoughts come from other people. Be careful the suggestions you put in other people's minds. It's very important that you're very careful of that. A lot of times people will put suggestions into your mind and, and one phrase can be the manifestation of Satan. Make sure the things that you say line up with the scripture. It's very important that you do that. Uh, but you don't even have to say anything. Your actions cannot line up with the scripture. And some person in the church that is, is growing in the Lord or has recently become weakened in the Lord can see you and your actions can cause them to trip up. And so that can be a form of spiritual warfare. How do you recognize deception? I'm going to spend a lot of time tonight, uh, just over the next few minutes as I as I go through this and then bring it to a close, talking about how I've learned to recognize deception, not only according to the Word of God, but from my own experience as the Word of God has played out in my life. Listen, there's nothing that isn't covered in the Scripture. There's nothing in the Scripture that, that there's nothing that isn't covered in the Scripture. Everything is either covered by specifics or by principle. We are given the keys to live a good and holy life in the Bible. When the enemy is attempting to deceive us, that action is a spiritual attack and it can be recognized as a thought, a feeling, or a doctrine that is contrary to God's word. The way I should be living, and it will affect others around me. It's contrary to the right way I should be living. It is a doctrine that is, that is contrary to a godly lifestyle. But just as often, it is not recognized. So just as often as spiritual warfare is recognized, it is also not recognized. And that is when it is most dangerous. The number one most dangerous thing, I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm not a military 
uh, expert, but I guarantee you that any general that's ever been in actual battle will agree with my statement. I know that Sun Tzu, the 3,500 year old, uh, you know, the author of the 3,500 year old book, The Art of War, would agree with this statement. The number one most dangerous thing you can do in the battlefield is not recognize your enemy. Because it, A, you won't see the attack coming. And B, you may kill the wrong person. Okay? What if the uniforms were all the same? It's very dangerous. You have to know what the enemy looks like. So there will always be subtle or obvious signs between the truth and a lie. Sometimes they will be subtle. Sometimes they will be obvious. What does the Bible say about the serpent? He was the what of the garden? The most blank of the animals in the garden. Subtle, right. Subtle. And so that, uh, I remember my Sunday school teacher, Brother Ricky, said in, in his, he, he taught us this. I never knew that that word, how it was pronounced. And so I grew up thinking the word subtle was pronounced subtile <laughs> because that was the central Louisiana way of saying subtle. And he taught us in Sunday school that the serpent was the most subtile. And if he was watching this, he would laugh too because he's a good guy. And um, but so the subtleness is the ability to slip something in, make you feel a certain way and sneak up on you which is called manipulation. I've known people that bragged about being manipulators. I never respected a one of them. Because for me, respect is more important than anything else. I don't respect people that manipulate other people and brag about it. That's a terrible, terrible thing to do. I believe honesty is the best policy. And I think the Bible teaches that too. A pastor ought not be a manipulator. A preacher ought not be a manipulator. I'm here to preach the word and let the word touch your hearts. The Bible doesn't manipulate people. The Bible moves on people and gives you open and honest, without a bait and switch, open and honest discussion. The Bible is not afraid to be discussed with, it, with other people. God's not afraid to have his word discussed with other people. He's not trying to manipulate you, which is uh, to, to make you feel a certain way while sneaking up on you. So if I have a thought or feeling from someone else that piques my interest, sometimes that thought or feeling will weaken my state spiritually. A person is especially susceptible to deceptive thoughts and doctrines if he or she has sin in his or her life that has not been dealt with. But a righteous person can be deceived. How can a righteous person be deceived when he or she does not have sin in his or her life? By being offended. Okay? Because we can be offended and receive an offense, and through that, a, a deception can come, and that offense can eventually become bitterness, which is, in fact, a sin. That wound in our heart is fertile ground from which Satan can, on which Satan can sow bad seed. So a righteous person can be deceived if he or she has not, does not have a strong understanding of the word. You have, no relation, you have no excuse for not having a strong relationship with the Word of God. You have time to read the Word of God. Every one of you has time to read the Word of God. Every one of you has time to pray every day. All you need to do is take time away from something else. And it doesn't take that much to start with. I suggest you start with five and five. And build from there. Five minutes of one and five minutes of the other. And just make sure you're not going to keep it that way. But build from there over a set amount of time. There's no excuse for us not having disciplines in our lives. So I may begin by having a problem with my church or someone in my church. Usually it's the pastor. I'm going to tell you something right now. Spiritual attack will eventually find its way. A spiritual attack in the church in some, someone's family will eventually find its way to being against the pastor. Um, I may have a spiritual attack in which I have a problem with myself. <laughs> it can actually happen. That's called worry. So it, that's what's going to happen is there will be just a little bitty thing that will get in someone's spirit. I have a problem with somebody. And that problem will be fertile ground for the enemy to sow bad seed. Pastors are not infallible. 
But a spirit of deception will frequently give someone a negative attitude towards the pastor. I'm just going to tell you right now, straight up, this is a blunt message, but it's very necessary because we don't recognize deception as what it is. That attitude may be cloaked in all sorts of good intentions. And I, I want you to know something. You're not going to find good doctrine on the Internet. God did not give you the Internet. He gave you a church. And God did not give you that Internet preacher. He gave you a pastor. And he gave the church as a body of believers that is gathered in person. Okay? And there's only a very small group of people in this world in countries where they can't meet. And in, in, you, you can say, and even in China, they meet in person. Did you know that? They have conferences in person. And so the, they, they have the internet services in certain countries when they can't meet, but they still try to meet in person, which is the whole point of what I'm doing over the next four weeks, four and a half weeks, is going to a place where they have oftentimes persecution for meeting in person. And so the internet will not give you good doctrine. It will not teach you the truth of the Word of God. You are capable of understanding the Word of God on your own through the preaching of the Scripture in your own church. The, it, the Internet is filled with deception and the devil's fingers are constantly clawing at you. My church attendance, because I have a problem with somebody, probably my pastor, may begin to become less consistent and perhaps I'm no longer as moved by the Spirit and the Word as I used to be. These are signs of deception. I may begin to develop a, ne a negative attitude about everything and everybody in the church. This is a sign of deception. My personal prayer life might become weaker or non-existent. I may begin to believe things like prayer isn't about quantity of time, it's about quality of time. What, what kind of garbage I heard that stuff all the way back in Bible school, and I believed it for a couple of years. So for a couple of years, I quit praying because I began to believe just one minute of prayer a day is going to make, and I began to slip and fall. When I said five and five, it's not so you stay with five and five, it's so that you start and begin to build on that. You need to spend a certain amount of time and a certain quality of an amount of time with prayer. If you don't pray, if you don't read your Bible, you will be deceived and you will fall away. I'm not saying you might be, you will, because church is not enough for you to stay in church. I'm talking about church services. They're not enough for you to stay in church. You've got to have a relationship with the Word of God outside of the church and with God outside of the church. So then all of a sudden I'm mad at everybody and everything and I don't even know why. So then my study of the word and my prayer time might become non-existent. Or I think that watching sermons or listening to sermons replaces prayer. Can't do it. Can't do it. There's good, there's good, okay? There's good that you're watching. But understand again, as I say this again, when you are listening to sermons and watching sermons, you're listening to somebody else's pastor. And so what's happening right now, and for the last 10 years is happening, is people in the church will develop different doctrines from their pastor because they heard it from so-and-so down in Louisiana or up in Alberta or over in Saskatchewan or in Maine, and they hear those things, and all of a sudden you've got varying doctrines in the church. That isn't unity. Neither is the New Testament teaching of uniformity revealed in that because Paul taught unity and uniformity when he said, I would that you all speak the same things. In Corinthians, he said, the house of Chloe is telling me that there's divisions among you and you're not speaking the same things. So that's not how church works. And it certainly isn't how we reach Harris in East Central Minnesota. Deception, deception, deception. The devil is a liar. And he works through the minds and he works through evil spirits and he chooses to work through the mind more often than not because he does not want to make himself known. So if there's sin in a person's life, the enemy will often purposely stop the temptation of a greater, in favor of a greater deception. I have seen people delivered of drugs when they left the truth and got false doctrine. And they weren't delivered of drugs by Jesus. They were delivered of drugs by the devil. If you don't think he can do it, you ain't seen nothing in this world. I've seen the devil deliver people of promiscuity and all sorts of things. And all of a sudden they're delivered because they left the church. You know if the same devil that tempts you is able to stop tempting you? Because the Lord tempteth no man. And he will back away from you and all of a sudden, I feel so free. I no longer want that crack. 
Don't you know that the devil is waiting on you? He's waiting about a year and bam, every one of those people back in it way worse than they ever were before because the Lord didn't deliver them. They got a false doctrine and they felt free for a moment. And I've, I've heard it. I've heard everything, folks. I've heard it all. That is a trick of the enemy. Jesus said that the devil's going to always come back with a vengeance. And he talks about seven other spirits. If I'm jealous of others, if I'm jealous of authority, I'm showing my own personal insecurity. What people don't realize is that jealousy reveals insecurity. That is an open door for deception. It is a form of deception. If I can recognize these things in myself, I can stop the deception before it starts or stop it before it continues. If I will submit to God's word and his plan and the authorities that are in his word, then I can defeat deception and I can back away from it. Let's discuss discernment versus discerning of spirits. The Bible clearly reveals to us that there is a difference between discernment and discerning of spirits because the Old Testament talks about discernment and there wasn't any Holy Ghost given. And Jesus talked about discernment and John 7 says the Holy Ghost wasn't given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so no one in the Old Testament before, which is everything that happened before Jesus' ascension and enthroning on high in the day of Pentecost, uh, which succeeded that, nothing uh, prior to that was the New Testament. The, the New Testament began on the day of Pentecost. The church began with the outpouring of Jesus' fulfilling of His covenant, which came on, Pe on Pentecost, and that was Jesus. And Peter said, this is Jesus that was poured out to you. He hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. And under that old covenant, there was still Jesus' commandments to the Pharisees. You should have more discernment. You know how to discern the weather, but you don't know how to discern the times. You know who did discern the times? Heathen kings, heathen princes from a foreign land. Coming from as far away as, as Persia and Ethiopia. And they discerned the truth of the birth of Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees did not. And none of them had the Holy Ghost. So discernment is not something that comes from the Holy Ghost immediately, intentionally, necessarily. You can have discernment and not even believe in God. Because you have wisdom. But then there is discernment that can come from the Holy Ghost. But that's not the same as the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is expected to be revealed and manifest in our lives, which is the discerning of spirits having to do with knowing the difference between other people's spirits and the things that they say, your own spirit and evil spirits versus good spirits. Because the Bible says us, tells us there are good spirits and that they are angels. And so we need to have both the discerning of spirits and discernment. If we have those things, if we have wisdom and we have the Holy Ghost, we are less likely to be deceived. Uh, we still have to watch out for um, offenses and al allowing those to happen. So how can I learn the skill of recognizing a human spirit that has evil intentions and knowing the difference between that and the an evil spirit working through a person. First of all, I'm going to say, it, when you, the best way to know an evil spirit working through another person is to ask somebody that has had that experience because it is a very unique thing. And I have, I've experienced people that were angry with flesh and I've experienced people that were angry with the spirit. And I will tell you that there were all sorts of manifestations in that person's life over a period of time that revealed themselves as one word, weird, weird, strange things happening. I've been preaching and I've had people glare, a supernatural glare at me over and over and over again from the same seat on the same pew for years. And I knew that was a demonic power. And I would have preachers come to the, at the two different churches that I was at and they would identify those spirits in the pews. And then I've had situations where there weren't weird things happening, but it was just a person that was acting like a human being. Spiritual warfare through human means and spiritual warfare through demonic means. Both of them had the potential to deceive me because both of those types of people were seemingly invested in making me feel bad as a pastor and making me feel horrible about who I was or what I was doing. The attack, and I have felt that 
over and over and over again. The spirit of deception always feels like intimidation. And I know what intimidation feels like because I had my share of bullies in my life when I was younger. And it feels the same way, but way more intense. So have you ever experienced this? Does anybody here know? You, you can say yes or raise your hand. Have you ever experienced that spirit of intimidation? Have you ever felt like you, were, you, you believed something and then all of a sudden it didn't really fit with the word of God that was being preached or what you knew to be true about yourself? A lot of times spiritual attack will come about making you feel a certain way about yourself. You are such a loser. You are a terrible person. You will never get freedom from this. And you are just, that God will never love you. You ever heard these voices? They are condemnation. We can either let them sit in our lives and stew in them. Or we can get rid of them by taking authority over them and cast down. See, my hands are up on this idol. This idol is the, the way that I view myself. Terrible. I, I just I've built this idol up and I'm worshiping it the way I feel so horrible about myself. The Bible says, take that idol and cast it down. Because we can worship self-pity and end up being pride. So um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The devil is not using new tactics. Did you know that? Why is he not using new tactics? Because the old ones work. Why do they work? Because human beings don't ever change. I mean, unless we get a hold of the Holy Ghost live wire and baptize in Jesus' name, human beings don't ever change. They're going to shake your hand and smile, and it's a politician's smile. In the words of the song from the 70s, I can't remember who it was, forgive me, but I'd like to help you, son, but you're too young to vote. It's the song, The Summertime Blues. And I love that line. And then I think a country singer, Alan Jackson, redid the song. But that's, that is the devil right there. Brother Nate, come up here and shake my hand. How old are you? Fifteen and a half. Fifteen and a half. And you, you've come to me today to do something for you. I'm your congressman, okay? And you're fifteen and a half. I want you to know that I want to meet your mom and dad, but I can't help you, son, because you're too young to vote. Now go sit down. <laughs> I should be in Washington. <laughs> that is what the devil is like. Sneaky, slimy, manipulator. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. In other words, even if I didn't feel like it, I forgave you in Jesus. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So to, ignorant, to be ignorant means to be unknowing. We are not unknowing of his devices, which means we have learned the devices. Now, is he talking about devices like the, the computer that you have in your pocket that you text people on? No. A device is a plan that is carried out in the English language. It does not just mean a machine. So the devil has a plan that is carried out. And that phone in your pocket is a plan that's carried out. It works the way it was supposed to, usually. And that's the same way with the devil's plans. He executes those plans and they work the way he is supposed to. We're not supposed to be ignorant of them. We're supposed to know what is coming. We're supposed to know that deception can come and will come. The Bible tells us offenses will come. We should be expecting that there will be difficult times. We should expect opposition. Everybody say, expect opposition. We should not think that there is anything involving a bowl of cherries in living for Jesus Christ. But there is the power to turn situations that are involved with life into good things through the Holy Ghost. So we should not think anything regarding some sort of financial prosperity gospel that you're going to get to some place where there's no problems ever. Everything's going to be just fine. We should expect opposition. And if you expect opposition, you will lessen your chances of being deceived. Make better decisions and you will lessen your chances of being deceived. Don't have a bad attitude towards anybody in the church. And if you do, take care of it and you will lessen your chances of being deceived. Understand how the devil works, not from some sort of fascination, but just read the word of God and see how he treated Samson and Delilah and see how he treated Adam and Eve and see how he treated Jesus and see how he treated Paul and see what happened between, between Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and how the Holy Ghost fixed all of that situation. 
and see how the devil treated Judas after he had chewed him up and spit him out uh, and then learn the way he works and don't go down that road and you will lessen your chances of being deceived. We have no excuse for being deceived. Turn around. And follow Jesus. Paul admonishes us to constantly search for forgiveness. He says specifically there that unforgiveness is one of Satan's devices. He's saying right there, even if I didn't feel like it, he's insinuating, even if I didn't feel like it, I'm going to forgive you in the person of Christ, whether you ask for forgiveness or not. And let me tell you something. Going up to somebody and saying, I forgive you for hurting my feelings when that person has not said, I'm sorry for hurting your feelings is a great way to get slapped. So I do not suggest it. Just get on your knees and say, I forgive Brother Nate for not shaking my hand the right way a few minutes ago. I'm saying it to the Lord, not Nate. He doesn't, Nate can't even hear me. I'm talking to Jesus about my offense with Nate. I'm not really offended at you. But I'm talking to Jesus about it. And so it doesn't matter if the person asks for forgiveness or not. Forgive them lest Satan should get an advantage of us. An advantage is a hole in my armor right there. Go right through where the arrow can get through. The devil, devil doesn't need to use new tactics because he is a good student of human nature. He was the original corrupter of human nature and Adam and Eve worked right alongside with him, didn't they? There's deception out there. There's someone out there, there's people out there saying... Anytime the Bible says something that you don't understand, it's because it's using Hebrew poetry. That's not taught in the scripture. That's absolute garbage. That's coming from Hillsdale College, which I used to respect. You don't understand the word of God if you haven't gone to a class and learned Hebrew poetry. Because the Bible says that, and it's an addition of a question that is not in the Bible to create a problem in your mind so that that teacher can manipulate you. You don't have to go to theological school to understand the Word of God. As a matter of fact, I don't recommend that you do because they teach a lot of garbage. So much garbage. Additions to the Word of God. You don't have to learn Hebrew to understand the Bible. You just need to pray and fast and call on the name of the Lord, come to church, fall under authority. You're not going to agree with everything I say. When you don't agree with it, come and talk to me with the right spirit and talk to other people about the Word of God. You've got Bible studies. You've got ways to talk to each other. But you don't have to learn Hebrew to know the Word of God. I don't think it's wrong to learn Hebrew. And it will give you a deeper understanding of the culture in which the Bible was written if you learn Hebrew and Greek. And you're going to have some fascinating conversations. And you'll love it. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be more saved. Because there is a deception out there that you can't... I, I want you to know you can understand the Word of God. I'm here to help you understand the Word of God. But I hope that you take what I give you and run with it. I don't hope you take what I give you and say this is all there is. Because that is what a lot of people come to church looking for. Pastor, you just tell me this. That's not how it works. You've got to take it. You've got to run with it. You've got to have your own walk with God. Any preacher that ever tells you that he is the only one that can discern the Word of God for you. Problem. The pastor is a pickpocket trying to steal from you your own spiritual authority to know and understand the Word of God and live for God. Let's talk about deceivers in closing. I'm talking about people who deceive. We recognize their tactics. Teachings of deceivers always eventually go against the idea of authority, even though they don't want you to go against their own. So the people that teach De deceptive doctrines will always eventually come against authority, but not their own authority. So this is a hypocrisy. The teachings of deceivers nowadays are using the catchphrase, church hurt, to describe biblical correction. I can tell you about some church hurt. I've had some church hurt. And I know some people that aren't in the ministry that have had church hurt. I know somebody that is not in the ministry that was molested by her youth pastor. You want to talk about church hurt? Church hurt don't have nothing to do with your pastor correcting you. Church hurt don't have nothing to do with the pastor saying something from the pulpit that maybe wasn't even exactly wise for the pastor to say. That's not church hurt. Okay? 
Pastors make mistakes. I've made mistakes. I've apologized for things I've said in the pulpit. The pastor losing his temper is not church hurt. Because you know what? Human being. Church hurt is not having a difference of opinion with somebody in the church. Church hurt is a made up term that is intended to make the pastor look like the villain in every single situation. Every page you go onto the internet that has something about church hurt will always be attacking authority in the church. Specifically, it will be attacking the idea of a pastor. Because the goal of people that talk about spiritual abuse and church hurt, in some cases their very stated goal of their website is to eventually tear down the idea of the pastor as in the pastor being spiritual authority in the church. So that eventually we get to the point where we're just like every other church where the pastor has absolutely no spiritual authority in the church and he's just an errand boy for the rest of the people in the church and does whatever they say. Now that's not according to the scripture. That's not according to spiritual authority in the scripture. And it don't work. It doesn't work. And so that's how you end up with no doctrine in the church. It's because you make the pastor so afraid that he can't even preach in the church. So nine times out of ten, when you read about church hurt, read what actually happened. You'll never be able to find it because it will be some vague insinuation and you'll never actually find out what happened. If you want to know if somebody's really been church hurt, ask them what actually happened and get all of the details. And when you find out that he or she has no idea what actually happened, that they just got mad about something, then you'll know that Brother Hush was right about the term church hurt. It's usually a bunch of garbage. Because I'll tell you some people that have really been hurt by the church. And it's some messed up situations. Because people do things. And nobody talks about those things. Because they were so horrible, nobody wants to talk about them. But they want to talk about, Pastor said this and this and this and this. Pastor's going to say stuff. I try to stay with the Word of God. If you have a problem with it, come and talk to me. And you will be able to avoid the concept of church hurt. Downplaying the importance of preaching. Deceivers downplay the importance of preaching. And this is happening all around the world. (laughs) Preaching is not that big of a deal. You can just stand in the pulpit and say whatever you want to. It all sounds the same. You can get your ideas from anybody else. Did you know that the Bible teaches for the pastor and the preachers in the church to actually go to God and talk to God about what they're saying? Did you know that the Bible says that I'm supposed to be talking to God about what I'm preaching to you? Did you know that I actually talked to God before I put these notes down? Preaching is the primary way, the New Testament says, that God chose to get the gospel to the church. The spirit of deception will attack preaching because preaching has power over the devil. You know what's more powerful than oftentimes rebuking a spirit by its name? Preaching a message about it without actually calling it by name because the preaching of the word has authority and the devil hates it. So he's going to go after it so that eventually we're a church where we all sit around a table and talk about the Bible, but no one ever preaches. That's the spirit of deception. And it's very, very much in the modern church world. We, we can teach and we can preach. That's OK. We'll let you do that. Make sure you don't ever mention any specifics. Or if you mention specifics, make sure you only mention specifics, but don't ever preach about principles. These are doctrines, false doctrines that I've been hearing ever since the mid 80s. Ever since I was a kid, I heard this stuff at the church that I grew up in, one of the churches that I grew up in. We are commanded to follow the word of God. Jesus told us and the the apostles went on to tell us that the foundation of the church is the law and the prophets and the apostles. They're the foundation of the church. Jesus completed the law and the prophets. Everything they preached was completed in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 2 that Jesus gave, after he had ascended, he gave commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. The very beginning of the book of Acts says we're supposed to be listening to the teachings and the commandments of the apostles. And if we're not teaching from the epistles and the scripture, then we're not teaching right. We are supposed to be following the teachings of the apostles and we're supposed to be following the pattern of the apostles. And there is a strong teaching in the modern church against the teachings of Paul. But Peter said that the teachings of Paul were godly teachings. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 15 through 16, 
Peter said, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So Paul wasn't preaching from his own opinions. According to the word of Peter, who had the keys to the kingdom on the day of Pentecost. And he said, Paul was not preaching under his own power. He is preaching under the wisdom given unto him. He's written you letters also in all his epistles, speaking them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. People lose their theology. I've had conversation after conversation after conversation with friends, former friends and family members and people that I was reaching for. And I have never found one person that was able to answer me according to the scripture when they were coming against doctrines that I was teaching or that I believed in. Because the, at the end of the conversation, they would always say the same thing. Well, you shouldn't follow the teachings of Paul or because Paul isn't really doesn't really go with the rest of the New Testament, which is ridiculous. It fits perfectly and dovetails beautifully. Or they'll say something like, well, we really can't even prove that we have the Word of God. That's a great way to win the argument. Or to back out of the argument. We can't even really say that we have the Word of God. I know that I have the Word of God because I've tested it. I've tried it. I've found that it's true. I've given you some tools tonight to put in your toolbox to defeat deception before it even starts. But I pray that if it has started, that you will take those tools out and fix the problem. And don't allow the devil to deceive you because once you go down that road, the one thing that will keep you from turning around more than anything else is pride. And it doesn't matter who is right. It doesn't matter who is wrong. Just get your way back into the truth 100%. And don't ever let the devil trick you in your mind because once that seed is there, the plant is so hard to pull up. And I've given you some tools to defeat the devil without ever rebuking the devil. I've taken authority over the devil tonight. And you can do the same thing because you have spiritual authority in your life. Through baptism in Jesus' name and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you have the power to speak against that. I'm not saying you shouldn't rebuke the devil. And if he's standing in front of you, do so please. Because Jesus said, said that he did it. And greater works shall you do because I go unto my Father. But a lot of times you don't have to because you just speak the word of faith. And the word of faith will terrify the devil. And you know what? Sometimes, Sister Jackie, you can just get up here in church and just start praising the Lord and you did much better than rebuking the devil praise can't do everything but praise can do a lot of stuff and sometimes you can quote the scripture and brother James admonished us tonight earlier he said when you get a scripture in your mind pray it you may have to pray it two or three times a day you know what's on my mind all the time thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee I've been hearing that scripture ever since I was a little kid. I went to stay with my sister and she was praying over her boys at night, my nephews. And she would make them repeat that before they went to bed. It's been in my mind. And when I need peace, perfect peace, I say, Lord, help me get my mind stayed on you. And then I repeat that. Repeat the word and you'll make the devil so mad his head will spin around like a top and explode. And that's what I want to do. Yay. Yay. Make the devil's head explode. We're not supposed to hate anything, but we can hate sin and the devil. Okay? So that's, that's not of this world. All right? We love people, but we hate the devil. And we can defeat him. We can overcome him. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for his word. Thank you for truth, Lord God. Thank you for the one truth, which cometh not from any man, but came by the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for your word. The download from the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed is your name, Jesus.